Welcome, and thank you for joining Faith United Methodist Church for our Mother's Day worship service. My name is Caitlin Nesbitt. I am the Associate Pastor at Faith. We are excited that you have joined us for worship today because we have a pretty awesome service prepared. A few things that we at Faith want to make sure you are aware of. At 1015 on Sunday mornings, we are offering a virtual taste of faith. This is a time for fellowship. We meet for about 45 minutes where we can just be together on Zoom. You can find a link on our website as well as on our Facebook page to join us for that virtual taste of faith. Also, each Sunday, we have a Sunday School lesson available that our children's director, Kim Clifton, and her kids have prepared for us. This is available at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings through our kids' Facebook page, also on our website, which we'll link it to the YouTube. Um, finally, if you are having difficulty reaching any of our services, particularly our Facebook Live service, or you know someone who has difficulty reaching our services, we have a techie team available to help. So please contact the church office and we'll be sure to connect you with someone on that team. Now let us join together with our Faith Rising Band for our opening song. with a quiz. Yeah! What? A quiz? Yep, a quiz. So get those hands ready to be raised. I want you to raise your hand if you have a mom or if you know a mom. I have two hands up. 
All right, awesome. Today is Mother's Day, right? The day that we celebrate moms all over. It's so exciting to tell them how much we love them and give them extra kisses on the one day a year that's just for them. And did you know, I was, I've been thinking about moms lately and I was thinking how moms do a lot of stuff, right? They get us up in the morning for school. They make us breakfast and usually pack our lunches. They make us dinner. They drive us to baseball and dance and hockey and soccer and tennis and softball. Uh, they take us on bike rides. They play outside. They push us on the swing. They tuck us in at night. They read us bedtime stories. They make sure we take our showers so we're not stinky. Ew. They do lots. They take care of us when we're sick. They drive us to church and Sunday school. Moms do so much. And when I think of moms, I think of superheroes. Moms are like Batman. Moms are like Superman. Moms are like Captain America, right? They are superheroes. So today, boys and girls, I want you to give your moms extra hugs and kisses. Make sure you let them know how much they are loved on Mother's Day. I hope that you all have a great week. And I will see you next week, boys and girls. Bye-bye. Happy Mother's Day. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah. Thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. A note as we enter into our time of prayer, prayers of the people is a call and response. And so when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you are invited to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord, throughout our lives, you send us people who teach us of your courage and strength. Through whatever obstacle we face, you send us those who help us overcome. Open our ears to hear the words of wisdom that you gift those in our lives. Open our hearts for those words to settle. Lord, we give you thanks for the women that you have placed in our lives. We give you thanks for our mothers, for the women in our lives who gave us the gift of life, the ones who taught us everything from tying our shoes to how to live as your children in the world, the ones who made sacrifices for us, who put our well-being before all, and who have done more for us than we will ever know. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for our grandmothers, aunts, sisters, and all women who have taught us of your love, the women that, for some of us, were more of a mother than the one who gave us birth, 
We give you thanks for the strength of these women who teach us about the love that you offer for us. Guide us to share the lessons that we have learned from them with those in our lives. Let their and your legacy live through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you those who have lost their mothers and maternal figures, those who wish to be mothers but struggle to conceive, mothers who have lost their children. We pray that you comfort all who grieve. We lift up to you the mothers who are at their wits end, who don't know what to do next, who feel as if they are family. We pray for your guidance and for your assurance in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we lift up to you those who are ill at this time, those who are fighting COVID-19 virus, those who have faced or will soon face medical procedures, those who are ill in the hospital, rehabilitation center, and at home. We ask that your strength rests upon them. We lift up to those who we now name in our hearts during a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray together the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will walk in the light. We will walk in the light. Yes, we will walk in the light of the
scripture today is from Genesis, chapter 45, verses 4 through 8. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship today as we uh, conclude our Overcomer sermon series. Today is Mother's Day, uh, so let me begin by sharing my thanks and my appreciation for all of the magnificent moms and wonderful women in our homes, in our churches, in our schools and community. You are the rock that holds us together. So thank you for your grace, for your sacrifice, and your love. Let's pray, and uh, we'll begin our message for today. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word that gives us life, direction, meaning. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are able to receive your word for us this day? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, I attended a seminar where the leader invited everyone uh, in the group to do an exercise. He asked us all to close our eyes and imagine ourselves having a child. He said, when your child enters into the world, you are given a script of their entire life. Now you have five minutes to look over this script and you can see everything your child will ever experience. And in addition to a script, you're also going to be given an eraser, which means that in these five minutes of your child's life, you can edit the script. You can erase any part. You can alter any section. So you look over the story of your child's life and you see that your child will have a learning disability in grade school. Reading, which comes easily for many kids, will be very challenging for yours. When your child is in high school, the script says that she'll have a wonderful circle of friends, but one of them, one of her closest friends, will get sick and die, and your child will experience grief and loss early in life. After high school, your child goes on to, co uh, to the college of her dreams, but while she's there, she gets into a car accident and is hospitalized for several months. She goes through a period of deep depression for part of this time. After college, she gets a great job at a great firm, but after just a few years, she loses that job due to an economic recession. Around the same time, she meets a fantastic guy who dates, uh, who they, they date together for several years. They even get married, but then they drift apart and they separate. And by the age of 30, your child experiences the traumatic pain of divorce. You have five minutes to read the script. The script reveals uh, every part of your child's life, and you have in your hand the power to erase certain parts. So what part would you erase? What would you change? For most of us, the natural temptation is to take out all of the hard stuff, the difficult and painful stuff. We want to erase everything that hurts, everything that causes grief and suffering. We want our children to live easy and smooth and uh, carefree lives, right? For those of us who are helicopter uh, parents, this gets even more specific. We want to make sure no one mistreats or says a bad word about our children. We want to provide everything good, protect them from everything bad. And at the very first uh, signs of trouble, we want to be able to swoop in and save the day. 
a friend of mine shared um, a, a, a time when he uh, was giving out uh, Halloween candy. This is a couple of years ago. And he was surprised to see a mom coming to the door. Now, this is more and more uh, a common sight, but this was several years ago. He was surprised. Uh, so this mom comes up, she rings the doorbell, and she says, Trick or treat, this is for my daughter. And when my uh, friend asked why her daughter wasn't trick-or-treating, the mom responded, It was a little chilly that day. And so she was driving her daughter around the neighborhood. And while they were driving, the little girl, she fell asleep. So now here's mom. Mom was trick-or-treating for her daughter. Before she left, my friend suggested to this mom that she eat all of her daughter's uh, Halloween candy and even get the stomach ache for her daughter. Then she really would have nothing to worry about to be worried about so if you could wave a magic wand or erase every failure every misstep every setback all the suffering and pain even the stomach aches uh, that your loved ones would have would you not that anyone would ever want to experience hardships in life but we know that they mold and shape us we know that they help us to grow and to mature. For many of us, our, our most pivotal moments in life, those times that define who we are, they were also the most difficult periods of life. So the key is this. Can we learn from adversity? Can we hold on to faith in the midst of trials? And can we uh, turn obstacles into opportunities? Let's uh, look at our text from the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. We'll just spend a few minutes spend, uh, reflecting on the life of Joseph, the great, great grandson of Abraham. Now, as a young man, Joseph, he had it all. For the first 17 years of life, Joseph, he was the, the golden child. He was the one with a technicolor dream coat. Even though Joseph had 10 older brothers, he was daddy's favorite by far because he was the number one son of the number one wife. When their father sent Joseph to check on his brothers, those who were working in the field, his brothers decided they had enough. They had enough of their father's favoritism. They had enough of their little brother rubbing it in. So when he came, they jumped him. They grabbed him. They stripped him of his robe. They threw him into a well and they sold him as a slave to a group of Midianites who were just passing through. In an instant, the boy who had everything, he lost everything. In an unexpected series of events, the golden child, the favorite son, he became a nameless, unknown slave. Isn't this the story of life? Life can change in an instant. Perhaps it's a car accident. Perhaps it's an economic recession. Perhaps it's bad news from a routine physical Perhaps it's a global pandemic that suddenly closes down schools and churches and forces everyone into quarantine. Or perhaps it's betrayal by those who you trust. This is what happened to Joseph. His life turned upside down at the precious age of 17, and the boy who had everything, he now had nothing. But Joseph, he didn't give up. He didn't despair. He learned from adversity. He held on to his faith. He turned his obstacles into opportunities. The Bible tells us that Joseph persevered. He worked hard, and God blessed the work of his hands. Over time, Joseph, he rose up in the ranks of uh, Potiphar's uh, servants. Eventually, he became Potiphar's uh, chief of staff, overseeing the entire household. Unfortunately, as Joseph attracted the attention of Potiphar, his master, Joseph also attracted the attention of Potiphar's wife. And the Bible tells us that Mrs. Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar, she tried to seduce Joseph because he looked like Donny Osmond. Okay, it doesn't say that second part. But, you know, you can imagine he just looked like Donny Osmond. And if you don't know who Donny Osmond is, Google him. Obviously, with someone like Donny Osmond in the house, Mrs. Potiphar, she couldn't resist. She couldn't help herself. Who could resist this hot Hebrew heartthrob? 
when Joseph rebuffed her advances. Uh, Mrs. Potiphar accused Joseph of attacking her, and Joseph was thrown into prison. The golden child who became a nameless slave, he rose up to be the head of Potiphar's household, but now he was thrown into prison. Again, Joseph's life just was turned upside down. Everything he worked to gain was lost. But Joseph didn't give up. He didn't despair. He learned from adversity. He held on to his faith. He turned his obstacles into opportunities. The Bible tells us that Joseph persevered. He worked hard, and again, even in prison, God blessed the work of Joseph's hands. This time, Joseph, he gained the favor of the prison warden. And the prison warden, uh, he uh, um, put Joseph in charge of all the other, other prisoners. And it was during this time when Joseph was the overseer of all the prisoners uh, that Joseph interpreted the dreams, interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's servants who were imprisoned for a time. Later on, years later, actually, after Pharaoh had a disturbing dream that no one else could interpret, Joseph was called on to interpret Pharaoh's dream. This one who turned obstacles into opportunities, this one who was an experienced overcomer, he was ready to embrace the moment. So Joseph not only told Pharaoh what he dreamed, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream for him. And as a result, again, this golden child who became a nameless slave, who became a convicted criminal, now became Pharaoh's second in command. Pharaoh gave him his signet ring and power over all of Egypt. Everything and everyone except Pharaoh himself was now under Joseph's authority. Life was good. Joseph got married, had two kids. Everything was going great until Joseph encountered yet another obstacle. This time it was his past. One day, Joseph was, uh, he was overseeing the granaries and his brothers showed up in Egypt. They were hungry. They were desperate for food. Joseph, he immediately recognized his brothers. Yes, they were older and grayer and balder, but he recognized them. He probably overheard them speaking to each other in the language of his youth. I imagine at this moment, Joseph, he had a flashback to the last time he saw them 20 years ago after they drummed him and stripped him of his robe and sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Now here they were bowing down and begging him for food. So how will Joseph respond? It's here, and it's in parts of scripture like this, that I really appreciate the honesty, the brutal honesty of our scriptures. We see Joseph, again, who seemed to have everything together um, through so much of the hardship. All of a sudden, he's unsure about what to do. We see Joseph overwhelmed by emotion. Now, there's at least seven times when the Bible tells us that Joseph wept. The Bible never says that Joseph wept when he was sold into slavery or when he was betrayed by Mrs. Potiphar, or when he was thrown in prison. But seven times when uh, Joseph is reunited and uh, you know reconnected with his brothers, the Bible tells us that Joseph wept. He's overwhelmed by the pain of his past, by the memories of his brother's betrayal. Clearly, this hurt that Joseph harbored in his heart, this was going to be his greatest obstacle yet. Let me say this a little bit differently. The pain inflicted by family, by the people we trust the most, sometimes they can cut more deeply than any other pain. So what does Joseph do? Joseph begins his reunion by accusing his brothers of being spies, which is a good excuse to throw them in jail. This buys him on one hand some time just to think, and I bet this also just feels good, even if it's just for a few days. After three days, Joseph, uh, he comes up with a plan. He devises a plan to see if his brothers have changed from their bullying ways from 20 years ago. So he holds one brother in prison and sends the rest home. He tells them that they cannot return to Egypt without bringing their youngest brother, Benjamin. Since the famine continues... 
Joseph's brothers, they're forced to return to Egypt with Benjamin. But before they can leave Egypt, Joseph sets up a a trap for Benjamin. Uh, He accuses Benjamin of being a thief. And he wants to see how his brothers would respond when they see yet another brother about to be enslaved. Well, the brothers, they respond this time by falling at Joseph's feet. They beg Joseph to show mercy uh, to their youngest brother. One of the brothers, Judah, uh, he even offers his life, his freedom, in exchange for Benjamin's. And it's at this point that Joseph has seen enough. He realizes that his brothers have truly changed. They're not the same as they were 20 years before. So Joseph, he reveals his identity. And this is uh, from part of the scripture that Wendy read for us a little earlier in Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, who you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph didn't want it. He didn't expect it. He certainly would have erased all the pain and suffering that he experienced in life. But in the end, Joseph understood that that God brought good from all the bad. God brought blessing from all his suffering. The key was this. Learning from adversity, holding on to faith, and turning obstacles into opportunities. Friends, this is also true for you and I. Think about the troubles that you're experiencing today. They might be health concerns related to friends or family. They might be relational concerns related to siblings or spouses or children or grandchildren. They may be financial concerns as businesses are struggling to survive, as stocks have plummeted and are just going crazy. Some of you are concerned about your future. Others of you are just weighed down by your past. Whatever it is that you're facing, I encourage you, remember the testimony of the scriptures who teach us again this. Learn from adversity. We're all going to experience it, so let's learn from adversity. Hold on to faith and turn obstacles into opportunities in Jesus' name. I'll close with this. Before I learned all of these lessons from the Bible, I learned them first from my mother. My mom is the third of eight children. She lived through the Korean War. She met my father uh, when they were in seminary together, and then they uh, married and immigrated to New Orleans, Louisiana in 1978 to offer a better life for their two young children. My mother, she didn't speak any English, but she quickly taught herself how to communicate. She helped my sister and I to learn English until our English quickly got better than hers, and then she made it a point to teach us Korean so we wouldn't forget our roots. Now, my father, he spent most of his days in the church, in the office, and most of his nights at church meetings, so my mother also had the responsibility of nurturing us spiritually, and that's what she did. She taught us how to pray, to sing hymns, to read the Bible, all in Korean, of course, in words that I still don't fully understand, but I've memorized because they're blazed into my brain through sheer repetition. Most importantly, um, my mom taught us how to love. She taught us um, that, uh, that love is more a verb and it's less a noun. She taught us that love is actions and not merely feelings. Love is less the spectacular things and more the everyday ordinary things. It's sewing ripped jeans and holy socks late into the night. It's cooking breakfast and preparing lunches and waking up cranky kids early in the morning. It's playing games with us, laughing with us, caring for us, crying with us. It's putting others first, our needs always before her own. And no matter what challenges our family faced, whether they were financial, relational, physical, or all of the above, my mother taught us to be prayerful 
and grateful every day, to learn from adversity, to hold onto faith in the midst of trials, and to turn obstacles into opportunities. My guess is this is true not only uh, of my mom, but many of your moms as well. And even if your biological mom was less than perfect, my hope and my prayer is that God has sent other strong women into your life to love you, teach you, guide you, and nurture you in faith. So for all the moms and the families and all of God's incredible blessings, let us give thanks this day and always. Amen. As we continue our worship service, we do so with the receiving of our gifts and tithes. Giving, it isn't something that we do because it's mandatory for us. Instead, we freely give in celebration of all that Christ has given to us. It's one of the ways that we share our joy of Christ and all that Christ helps us to overcome throughout our lives. While we aren't able to give in the traditional sense of passing the plate, we still ask that you give as you are able. We do have an option where you can give electronically to the church, and you can do so by visiting our church website. Or if you have prepared an offering as a check, we invite you to mail that to the church as well. Let us say a prayer over our offerings. Lord, all that we have, it is from you. You have given us the very gift of life, the gift of those who guide and teach us throughout this life. You give us more than we could ever ask for. So, we give back to you just a portion of what you have given to us. We give ourselves, our gifts and talents to you. We ask that you bless these gifts, that we and our gifts are a sign to the world of how we overcome all through you. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue our worship service, we have a special laity report that we will receive from our lay leader, Dave Manchester. Good morning. During Sunday services in February, as one of our church's lay leaders, I provided a financial overview of our church and how both operational and broader theological and social issues were impacting us. Well, that was before we were faced with the current global pandemic. Some of those long-term issues have necessarily been set aside as we all deal with the new reality of this threat to our individual and collective health and well-being. Simply by the fact that you are watching or listening to today's service affirms that our church is an important part of your life. Today, I wanted to offer a brief report on the health of your church and offer a few suggestions about how we can all support its ministries and access those ministries ourselves in this time of need. First of all, the church's ministries continue to operate on many levels. Pastors Caleb and Caitlin and the rest of the staff, Sandy, Linda, Don, Kim, our music ministry and contemporary worship leadership, along with so many others, continue to innovate and find ways to provide support to the congregation and to the community at large. These online Sunday services have been wonderfully and thoughtfully produced by our ministers and by AV team members led by Diane Barnett. The church council, ably chaired by Lynn Lowe and the worship committee led by Sarah Kabicki, both are meeting weekly to discuss how Faith UMC can best deal with its current challenges and how we will reemerge as a strong congregation as the pandemic let, uh, risks lessen. Our trustees continue to look after our facilities and the finance and endowment committees are actively evaluating our monetary assets. We've developed phone a friend systems to stay in touch with congregants and continue to distribute information about the life of the church via email and surface mail. Our mini food pantry has been well supported by church members and it is serving many in our community. For us to continue the ministries of Faith UMC, 
like any business or family, we need to deal with its finances. While it is recognized that the economic disruptions associated with this pandemic may make it difficult or impossible for some families or individuals to sustain donations to the church, many, many members and affiliates of our church have found the ways to continue their financial support in recent weeks. Our online donations have never been higher, and many are mailing checks to the church to support our general fund, the pastor's emergency fund, and our building fund, Maintain Faith. While church activities have curtailed, many of our expenses have also been reduced. Other expenses, however, continue, and frankly, those expenses exceed our current income. Nonetheless, to date, we've been paying our bills, have paid our apportionment through March of this year, and most importantly, have been paying our staff. On that front, I have very good news. Faith UMZ was successful in obtaining a one-time loan or grant from the Small Business Administration through the National Paycheck Protection Program in an amount sufficient to pay all of our staff for approximately two and a half months. By the terms of this agreement, as long as we continue to employ the same number of staff members through the entire period, the loan will become a grant and will not have to be paid back. This provides a vital cushion and allows our entire staff to be able to focus on continuing our ministry and program. It's short term, but averts what otherwise would have been a looming financial and operational crisis for your church. No one knows how long the coronavirus disruption will last or how the social and economic recovery will play out. What we do know is that our church needs to continue to provide its services and ministries regardless of the circumstances. We are thankful for all who are working to make sure that this happens and all who are financially supporting those efforts. And I obviously encourage all of you to continue to support the church and your church family by whatever means are at your disposal. The membership vows that we all took to support the church with your time, your talents, your prayers, and your gifts have never been more important. If you have concerns, if you need assistance in any way, please contact the church at the regular telephone number and someone will get back to you pretty promptly. Thanks for listening and God bless.
Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Chris. Let's pray. Lord, for the gift of this day, we give you thanks. For the gift of your word that uh, gives us life, we give you thanks. Help us, Lord, not only to hear it with our ears, but, Lord, to respond to it with our hearts. Help us to hear again and and trust uh, ourselves into your hands. Help us to learn from adversity Help us to hold on to faith and help us to be women and men who are able to, um, in the midst of obstacles, turn our obstacles into opportunities of blessing, of growth, of love. We thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, special thanks uh, to our Faith Rising Band, our Chancel Choir, our AV team, our church staff, and thank you for joining us for worship. I hope you join us next week as we begin our summer, summer sermon series through the Gospel of Luke. It is 24 chapters. No, we're not going to cover uh, Luke for 24 weeks, but we will spend eight weeks covering the Gospel of Luke, three chapters at a time. At this time, please turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you, and so do I. And if you're all by yourself, just look into the camera. God loves you, and so do I. Uh, We'll close our service uh, with a blast from the past. I think this is 2011 or 2012. It's the Pathfinders Band, and they're singing uh, the goodie, the oldie, I am free. Enjoy.